Honored guests and fellow citizens, we pause for one hour in the course of our very busy lives to honor here in historic Portsmouth Square the memories of Captain John Berrien Montgomery of the United States Navy, who on July the 9th, 1846, with his gallant men, raised the stars and stripes over the Mexican port of Yerba Buena. When Commodore John Drake Sloat and Captain Montgomery executed their orders, the former at Monterey and the latter at what is now called San Francisco, they acquired for the United States more than 600,000 square miles of territory embracing the states of California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and parts of New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming, an historic event indeed. This occasion is sponsored by a far-flung group of San Francisco civic and fraternal patriotic organizations spearheaded by the native sons and native daughters of the Golden West, the San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce, the Society of California Pioneers, the Women's Chamber of Commerce, the California Historical Society, and the California History Board of the Native Sons of the Golden West, all represented here on the speaker's stand by their leaders. Time will not permit introduction of more than a few of these distinguished citizens. Your attention also is called to the necessity of rearranging somewhat the program in order to coincide with radio transcription requirements. <clears throat> this occasion is an appropriate one for pointing out the high regard in which San Franciscans hold and always held the United States Navy. A large number of our principal streets are named after naval officers who attended that picturesque ceremony in this plaza of Yerba Buena 100 years ago. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lieutenant Powell. I've often wondered, I was born here, but I've often wondered what Powell Street was named after with its famous cable cars. Lieutenant Powell, a Navy doctor aboard the Sloop of War, Portsmouth. Lieutenants Leavenworth and Hyde, the first military alcaldes of Yerba Buena, after its seizure by Captain Montgomery. Montgomery Street itself, Commodore Stockton, Commodore Jones, and Captain DuPont of Commodore Sloat's fleet. Sansom Street was formerly called Sloat Street. And we have other avenues and boulevards named in honor of Farragut, Sloat, and Dewey. Finally, on this very site, one of the world's greatest orations was delivered by Abraham Lincoln's lifelong son, Colonel Edward Dickinson Baker. First United States Senator from the Territory of Oregon. In Portsmouth Square, in mid-September 1859, on the eve of the Civil War, he delivered the eulogy here over the body of United States Senator Broderick, slain in a duel with California's Chief Justice Terry. That speech is credited, along with the great forensic efforts of Thomas Starr King, with having saved California for the Union cause. We now hear from the successor of the Alcaldes of Yerba Buena, the mayor of San Francisco, our own, Roger D. Lapham. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Nolan, honored guests and citizens of San Francisco. I've been sitting here and trying to picture just what this looked like a hundred years ago. We know that some hundred yards, a few hundred yards in front of us lay 
the bay of that day, the sleepy town of Yerba Buena. And then to think of what's happened since, the gold rush that followed a few years later, the building up of this town, the things that went on burned down four or five times in the first six or seven years of its life, and then going on to the great disaster of 1906, and then what we've been through in the last three or four years as the scene, the center of a great war on the Pacific, the departing center. And then I've been thinking how wonderful it would be if possible to live another hundred years and to see what's going to happen to this city and this state and this whole Pacific coast in the next hundred years. I know that we haven't begun to see the beginning of things. I'm certain that those who will follow us, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, will live in a city that will become the real city of destiny, the city of the Pacific era. Let's all take courage and press forward for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Lapham. Governor Earl Warren, unable to be present in person, has designated as his representative on this historic occasion the Honorable C.J. Goodell of the California District Court of Appeal. Judge Goodell. distinguished guests and fellow citizens. I have the honor to represent the governor of the state of California, Honorable Earl Warren, who is unable to be present today because of pressing official duties in the southern part of the state. Governor Warren, not only as a native of California, but as its governor, has taken a lively interest in this series of centennial celebrations which were initiated last month. And that has been made manifest by the fact that he proclaimed a state holiday on June 14th. He regrets very much his inability to be present and joins with the city of San Francisco and its people in this occasion commemorating the flag raising a hundred years ago. California's own Bret Hart addressed these familiar lines to San Francisco. Serene, indifferent of fate, thou sittest at the western gate. The growth and achievements of this city in this first century of its existence under American flag have been phenomenal, and one cannot begin to recount them on an occasion such as this. However glorious the accomplishments of the past 100 years have been, I would venture that had the governor been present today, the keynote of his message to us might well have been to take Bret Hart's lines as a text and to say that we no longer could be too serene nor too indifferent of fate, but that while rejoicing in the great progress which the century just closed has given us, all true, Californ all true San Franciscans and all true Californians must unite in facing the second century which opens today and by a wholesome cooperation with other great cities in this commonwealth and with the industrial, agricultural, and other interests of California not only visualize and contemplate the great things that can be done by a united and progressive population, but by the same energy which has characterized the people of this state in the past to bring such things to their full realization and fruition. The same Bret Hart in the same lines to San Francisco was not content 
with the serenity of which he first spoke, but he closes with these lines looking to the future, with which I too close. Then rise, O fleecy fog, and raise the glory of her coming days. Be as the cloud that flecks the seas above her smoky argosy, when forms familiar shall give place to stranger speech and newer face, and all fulfill the vision we who watch and wait shall never see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Goodell. Appropriately, the Navy reenacts here today the raising of the American flag. Appropriately also, we now hear from a most distinguished naval officer whose gallantry as a young ensign won him in 1915 the precious Medal of Honor. On duty in the boiler room of the USS San Diego, when her boilers exploded, he braced his foot against the wall and forcibly held open the electrically controlled watertight doors to permit his men to escape before the other boilers exploded and while steam immersed him. He won many distinctions since that heroic act, including the Navy Cross for heroism in World War I. And uh, having personally led the party that secured storm-tossed depth charges that had broken loose on the after deck of the USS Sampson. He won the Legion of Merit four times. Let us hear from Commodore Robert Webster Carey, USN, now Treasure Island. Commodore Carey. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, honored guests, and ladies and gentlemen, the celebration of this centennial is of great interest to the Navy because that day 100 years ago, which we commemorate now, was indeed a Navy show. The tremendous importance of San Francisco in the maritime world today is the fulfillment of a destiny ordained when the Almighty formed this magnificent bay and sent men here to discover it. It may be interesting to briefly trace the naval and maritime influence in the development of this bay and city. Strange as it may seem to us, particularly those of us who believe that San Francisco is the acme of perfection as a place to live, the Spaniards of that day did not seem to appreciate its importance. They considered it a wasteland and of not of much value. And it was only when the Russians and the British, still further north, began to take an interest in this area that the Spanish also began to take an interest in it. If they had known about Los Angeles as it has developed today, <clears throat> they would have been more interested. It is interesting to note that the Bay of San Francisco was not discovered by sea forces or seagoing people, but it was discovered by a party under the command of the then governor of Upper California, Portola. Some people say it's Portola, and I don't know which it is. Who on the 1st of November, 1769, discovered the bay and stayed here to map it. However, it was not until August the 5th, 1775, that it became important from a seafaring point of view when the first ship under command of Lieutenant Don Juan Manuel de Ayala sailed through the Golden Gate to spearhead that stream which has now swollen into a tremendous flood of shipping. <clears throat> 
In June of 1776, almost a year later, the first Spanish colonists settled here, and due to the colonial Spanish laws, no shipping but Spanish was allowed in the bay. However, you cannot prevent a sailor's curiosity from finding out things, particularly a Yankee sailor who is bent on earning an honest dollar. <clears throat> so it was not too long until the American ship Eliza, under Captain John Rowan, ostensibly for supplies, but not without recognizing the possibility of a little fur trading on the side, entered San Francisco Bay. San Francisco continued to progress, or it was Yerba Buena then, through the years. The growing fur trade of the Russians at Fort Ross and the British further north, the westward expansion of the United States, and the revolution in Mexico all began to center more and more interest in California. The interest of the United States in California, and perhaps it may be said the anxiety not to lose an opportunity to plant itself firmly there, is reflected in the mistaken effort of Commodore Catesby Jones to take it in 1842, working under the misapprehension that we were then at war with Mexico. Unfortunately, he stepped off out of turn and was required to haul the flag down again and make an apology to Mexico, which was quite correct. But it does indicate the alertness not only of the Navy, but of the entire United States at that time as to the possibilities and opportunity of California. It was not until July the 7th, 1846, that has already, as has already been stated today, that Commodore Sloat took over California for the United States and declared it to be occupied, and two days later, Captain Montgomery hoisted the flag here as an extension of the occupation. From that day, the interest of the Navy in San Francisco has never waned. In the 1850s, the necessity for having repair facilities on this coast for a fleet that was needed in the Pacific developed into the establishment of the Mare Island Navy Yard, which has been with you ever since. Following that development, the Navy has taken over Hunter's Point Treasure Island, Naval Air Station, Alameda, and various other permanent establishments in the Bay Area, not including those vast temporary establishments that we had here during the war. It's interesting to note that the frigate Independence, the USS Independence, was the first ship docked at Mare Island in 1855. As the mayor has so aptly pointed out to you, the potentialities of the future of San Francisco as a maritime uh, port and the potentialities of the city itself as a result of its maritime development are almost unlimited. What it turns out to be depends upon San Franciscans themselves. I know that the Navy will always contribute, as it has in the past, whatever it can towards the development of San Francisco, and may God bless the efforts of the San Franciscans themselves in its development. We will now hear, before raising the flag, from Mr. Edward D. Kyle, outstanding citizen and director of the Society of California Pioneers. Mr. Kyle. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, distinguished guests, my fellow citizens, in a few moments, you will see reenacted the raising of the flag at Portsmouth Square 
and the acquisition of California, and particularly San Francisco, by the United States of America. On July 9, 1846, a hundred years ago today, from the USS Portsmouth, a company of sailors and marines marched to this very spot and raised the flag of the United States. This symbolic conquest was richer in symbolism than its actors possibly realized because it meant an end to the gentle rule of the Don over the still more gentle countryside of Yerba Buena, and it opened the dramatic and climatic history of the city of San Francisco. Under the flag raised at Portsmouth Square, a new vigor was created, and our forefathers placed their courage with their flag and their faith in God and resolutely marched to their destiny. The sleepy, gracious Mexican outpost of the dying empire of Spain was soon transformed into a roaring mining camp. Bearded and booted men came over the great plains of America and in the tall ships that spot the sea to seek the gold of California and soon to make San Francisco a community of trade and of commerce and eventually the nerve center of the financial and business world of the Pacific. Yet, under this flag came other men, not seeking the wealth of the newborn land, but joining those who labored here in the earlier era to bring culture to this new land and to give to it a profound knowledge of the word of God and of his love and protection. A hundred years have passed from a small village clustered about this square to a metropolis in size and in grandeur equal to the ancient cities of the world. From a scattering of adobe and wood shacks to the towering citadels of steel and masonry that now surround us. From a harbor with a few adventurous sailing ships to a port unequaled in any city in the world. That is the material significance of the raising of the flag at Portsmouth Square. One hundred years have gone by. The, the men of God have built churches and synagogues, schools and colleges. Men and women have lived fearless and unafraid in this city of culture and tolerance. Their children have gloried in the romance of the blustering days of 49, but have carried with them the greater tradition of fair dealing and of fair play. For a city had been founded under a flag where all people may live, worship, and follow their chosen work in life without fear of their neighbor, or the whim of a despot, or the ideology of a totalitarian state. That is the spiritual significance of the raising of the flag at Portsmouth Square. It is because the people of San Francisco have realized this dual significance that the first centennial of San Francisco under the American flag is a record of startling achievement, courageous enterprise, and steadfast faith. 
we turn this century date and look forward to the next centennial in San Francisco's life, and we behold a world troubled, bewildered, hungry for material needs, and hungrier for spiritual standards. A new world, beckoning to men of high principle and courageous enterprise to seek the new horizon, and yet being limited in many parts of the world. by spiritual and even physical enslavement. No man can tell of tomorrow. No one can say what the future will hold for San Francisco. But we can take renewed hope in our ancient pr principles. And we can reflect and know the values of life that men have essayed and found true and worthy. And we can espouse these values and these principles and with them as traditional beacons walk confidently into the future. It was with a deep and reverent regard of the principles which the flag was raised 100 years ago that men today look upon this spot where the flag has flown for 100 years, and they find it a symbol of a government with the consent of the governed, a symbol that our government is a government of laws and not of men, a symbol of a free people, not a faceless mob, a symbol that to each man is given the inalienable right to seek and to make his own life, to conduct his own affairs, and to worship God in accordance with the dictates of his own conscience. As long as the flag at Portsmouth Square is truly the symbol of these ideals, then so long shall San Francisco have the spirit of life, the courage of its pioneers, requited, its cherished traditions nurtured, and its fame and future secure and serene. May God in his infinite wisdom preserve the city of San Francisco for centuries yet to come, and may he protect the flag that will fly at Portsmouth Square today forever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyle, for the maid of honor. Fifty years ago, at the semi-centennial of the raising of the American flag, both in Portsmouth Square and in Monterey. <clears throat> the Navy will now re-raise the American flag in salute to the gallant Americans who brought us into the great heart and soul of the United States of America on this happy day 100 years ago. The flag will be sent aloft by Seaman First Class Morton Lickerman and Walter Ingle, U.S. Naval Reserve, Treasure Island. Commander Bryant, will you have your battery of buglers give us to the colors? 